In this video, I'm going to be talking about aerobic capacity. So we're talking about VO2 max, and we're going to be talking about your anaerobic thresholds, things like lactate threshold, and how those things interact with each other in order to determine your ability to exercise um, aerobically and to continue to do it for a long period of time without fatiguing. Let's start off by talking about VO2 max or aerobic capacity. Uh, so this fairly simplistic diagram here has uh, work rate increasing, uh, progressively increasing on the x-axis, and the y-axis we have VO2 or oxygen consumption progressively increasing as well. And so when you look at these two together, as you increase your exercise intensity starting at rest to, through sub-maximal exercise all the way to your maximal ability to exercise, your VO2 or your oxygen consumption progresses at a fairly linear rate. It's not perfectly linear, but it's fairly linear, uh, which just means a straight line like this until the point of your VO2 max, and then it tends to sort of curve over and plateau. Um, but that is the point of your VO2 max. That's as high as you're able to um, go with your aerobic metabolism, which is why we call it the aerobic capacity. You always hear people, especially you know, endurance athletes, wanting to increase their VO2 max and increase their aerobic capacity. Um, what are the things that are going to limit your aerobic capacity and limit your VO2 max? So it's going to be limited by your cardiorespiratory system's ability to get oxygen out to the body, specifically to the muscle, and it's going to be limited by your muscle's ability to bring in the oxygen and use it aerobically within the mitochondria in order to produce ATP. So these are two different things um, that are going to have to work together in order to use oxygen to make ATP or to make energy. And this is going to be heavily influenced by both your genetics and your training. So the VO2 max is widely considered to be the single best indicator of cardiorespiratory fitness, um, which is closely related to athletic performance in endurance-based uh, athletics like distance running, but it's not necessarily exactly the same. Um, and so there are other factors that aren't included in the VO2 max assessment that we also need to be um, aware of in some shortcomings of the VO2 max. So some of the shortcomings of VO2 max is that it does not assess anaerobic performance. And anaerobic ability is important for endurance-based athletes as well because they do use a fair amount of anaerobic energy, especially when they first start and when they end the race or any time during the race where they might give a little spurt in order to catch up somebody or pass somebody. Um, the VO2 max also does not take into account the exercise economy. So what are the characteristics a good endurance athlete is going to have? So of course they're going to have a high VO2 max. They're also going to have a high anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold being one version of an anaerobic threshold. Um, they're also going to have really high exercise economy, so they're going to be really good at doing the activity without wasting energy with extra movements and things like that. And uh, for endurance athletes, you want a high percentage of your muscle fibers to be type 1 slow twitch muscle fibers. All right, so to show an example here of why, specifically why the, the anaerobic threshold uh, or the example of an anaerobic threshold, the lactate threshold, is so important for endurance-based performance. Now let's look at this diagram here. So very similar diagram to the previous slide. We have increasing work rate on the y-axis or on the, on the x-axis, and we have uh, increasing VO2 or oxygen consumption on the y-axis. And we have two different people. We have the one in purple and the person in green. So this purple individual has a 17% better VO2 max than the green uh, person here. And so they're going to be able to progress in this VO2 max test a little bit further, um, suggesting higher fitness levels. However, their lactate threshold happens at 50% of their VO2 max, where this green individual's lactate threshold is gonna happen at 65% of their VO2 max. And because they're not that far off from each other as far as their VO2 maxes go, this makes quite a big a bit of a difference because the actual difference between the exercise intensities so the work rates at these at these lactate thresholds is going to be about eight percent. So the person, the green person here, is going to be able to exercise at about eight percent higher work rate without feeling fatigued, without having a, a large buildup of acids in their body, um, and without a large buildup of lactate in their body as well. And so they can maintain a higher exercise intensity without those feelings of fatigue uh, 
than the person with the higher view to max just because they have the higher lactate threshold or a better term here probably the higher anaerobic threshold all right so let's talk more about the lactate or anaerobic thresholds so let's put a little more of a definition on what I mean when I say anaerobic threshold. So an anaerobic threshold is basically the, the exercise intensity where anaerobic metabolism exceeds aerobic metabolism to such an extent. So it's not just getting over it, but it has to be to such an extent where it's going to greatly reduce the exercise tolerance or the time to exhaustion, which is what I was talking about in the previous slide. So having a higher anaerobic threshold means that you can stay at, at a higher intensity without getting exhausted. And that's important for endurance-based sports because most of the race is spent at or around these anaerobic thresholds. Um, so to show a, an example here of a lactate threshold, we have somebody increasing their exercise intensity, approaching their sort of estimated, in this case, this is estimated VO2 max. It'd be the same if it was a measured VO2 max though. And we have their blood lactate on the y-axis. And so you can see here's their resting blood lactate level. It's around one or so. And it uh, sort of just kind of marches along, doesn't really change a whole lot all the way up until this person's lactate threshold around 66.8% of their, their predicted VO2 max. So you can see their resting lactate here was around one or so, and it stayed fairly close to that all the way up until their lactate threshold, which happened around 66, 67% of their maximal ability. And at that point in time, it just kind of skyrockets. And that's what I mean when I say a lactate threshold. So it's that point in time where the blood lactate, the measurable lactate, because um, we can't really measure in the muscle without taking chunks of the muscle out, but we can measure the blood pretty easily. But it's the that measurable blood lactate starts to rise rapidly as we continue to increase exercise intensity. Untrained individuals have a lactate threshold somewhere between 50 and 60% of their VO2 max typically, where trained individuals is a little higher, somewhere between 65 and 80% of VO2 max, which means they're going to be able to exercise at a higher exercise intensity without having this large spike in lactate, which is also accompanied by a simultaneous large increase in uh, blood and muscle acidity. Um, in the lactate, in the acid um, from various sources, is going to decrease extra performance and mean you have to slow down. So you don't want to cross your anaerobic threshold um, during an endurance-based uh, uh, athletic event until the very end, maybe the, you know, the kick at the end of the race, um, because once you cross it, your ability to maintain the exercise intensity for very long is going to be very, very limited. It's going to be a short period of time before you have to slow down. So let's talk about another type of anaerobic threshold. Let's talk about the Venezuela threshold, which tends to happen around the same point as the lactate threshold. And uh, there's a re reason for that. They're kind of tied to each other um, roughly. And so the ventilatory threshold is the point in time where our ventilation starts to increase at an exponential rate. Um, so similar to this, uh, it doesn't have a flat line. Your, your ventilation kind of creeps up slowly and then all of a sudden it, it exponentially increases, kind of like what's being shown here, but with lactate, it, it's fairly flat up until that, that threshold point. Um, but anyway, so the, the ventilatory threshold is when ventilation increases rapidly at a much faster rate than it what it did at lower intensities of exercise. So what causes the ventilatory threshold? It's the body and specifically the blood trying to buffer the acid that's being released into your blood through uh, during the exercise bout. And so it's the bicarbonate buffering pathway that's trying to buffer that acid that ends up producing extra CO2 that's going to stimulate extra breathing. And so you breathe off the extra CO2 and you end up um, breathing more heavily doing that, again, causing the, the venatory threshold then. Some other anaerobic threshold assessments that can be done that we're not gonna go into detail here about, but I just want you to be aware that they exist, is the heart rate deflection point, the onset of blood lactate, a maximal lactate steady state, and a critical power. So what are some uses of knowing someone's anaerobic threshold? Um, combining the anaerobic threshold with the VO2 max provides a pretty good way of predicting the performance in endurance-based sports and activities. So hopefully that makes sense to you now because I've discussed it a little bit already. Also, the anaerobic threshold provides some pretty critical information for uh, creating training programs for endurance athletes. Um, so the reason why it's so important and why it's helpful 
is it gives us some information about that individual's that specific individual's bioenergetics and as when they're transitioning from different pathways and various things like that you want to focus on some of those pathways in order to improve your ability to uh, perform in endurance based sports and so um, typically, uh, endurance athletes are going to do what we call threshold training. Um, there's some other names out there for this as well. And this is going to be where they specifically try to train at or near their inner threshold in order to sort of boost it up over time by improving those pathways and pr improving those enzymes within those pathways and improving the energy substrate uh, storage and things like that so that you can then exercise at a higher intensity without crossing those thresholds during the actual performance. So when we exercise at a high intensity, like what we've been talking about here, and we produce all this lactate and we produce all this acid um, separately, but you know simultaneously, uh, our bodies need to deal with that. We need to clear it out of our systems. And we also might get sore from doing this. So we might have delayed onset of muscle soreness or DOMS. The next video in this series, which I'll put a link to in the description below, is going to be talking about how our bodies remove and use lactate and also um, what causes DOMS.